can con men ever stop conning? I've heard fairy tales about reformed fraudsters. I think they're sort of like leprechauns. You, you have to believe in them sincerely or you can't see them. And what do you do when you're face to face with someone skilled in the art of verbal deception? Roy, I just never knowingly encountered someone like him before. Do you know why IMG played us in the Canton Hall of Fame? Because nobody else in Ohio wanted to play them. Someone who whose core mission is manipulation and charm. Welcome back to the BS High podcast, the official podcast companion to BS High, the HBO documentary. I am the host of the series, Mary Pallon. We hope that by now you've watched BS High on HBO and streaming on Max. If not, pause this podcast right now and please do so. This is the fourth and final episode of the series, our exclusive behind the scenes look at the making of the film. Today, we will be speaking with two brilliant minds. First, Trayvon Free, the co-director of BS High, who has a personal and unique access point into this story with his past life as a high school athlete at one of the top basketball programs in the country. It was everyone's ticket out of Compton. It was everyone's way of instant wealth and fame. <laughs> if you were able to get yourself to the next level, then in the second half of the episode, you'll hear from someone who knows as much about con men as anyone in journalism. The con men who are successful, they sound just good enough to be attractive, but never too good to be true because they're too smart to do that. That is Diana Henriquez. Diana and I were former colleagues at the New York Times. So once it became clear to us that Bishop Sycamore had a financial scandal tied to it, I reached out to Diana during production for her thoughts. She generously shared them and was kind enough to join us here. Among her many claims to fame, Diana was the first journalist to interview Bernie Madoff in prison, an experience recounted both in her book, The Wizard of Lies, and the HBO adaptation of it, where she plays herself opposite Robert De Niro as Madoff. But first, here's the co-director of BS High, Trayvon Free. What did sports mean to you as a high school student? What was your experience with athletics? I mean, I, I played at one of the premier high schools in the country when I was in high school. So it was like a big deal. Like it was year round AAU ball at Dominguez High. And, you know, Tyson Chandler was my teammate. A lot of, um, a lot of pro athletes came out of that school. So sports was like big, big business, a big deal. You saw all the top basketball and football coaches in the country from high schools, I mean, from uh, colleges, you know, in and out of our school trying to recruit players. I was fortunate enough to play on those really high profile AAU teams. And, you know, my high school team, we won the national championship my freshman year. We were three peak state champions my sophomore year. It was everyone's ticket out of Compton. It was everyone's way of instant wealth and fame. <laughs> if you were able to get yourself to the next level, and so it was treated as such. It was very much back then too, still kind of the wild west of paying players on the side and, you know, doing what you had to do to get the player to come to your school. You know that it isn't easy being a, an elite high school athlete. What does it take as a teenager to play at that level? It's a job. It's insanely time consuming and difficult in the sense that if you're a high school kid playing at that level, at the level of Pete Carroll's at my school every week, looking at the football team and, you know, Mike Krzyzewski's at your game sitting on the baseline. That's because you are playing at such a high level that, you know, school is almost secondary to that because you're practicing 20, 30 hours a week. You're traveling, playing all the other high, like best schools in the country, like a college team. And so getting on those teams is one of the most desirable things, be it football or basketball, but, but it's also insanely hard because, you know, you, you have to live in a certain area to be, a, be able to play for certain teams. And then you have to be good enough to make those teams. And, and if you're, if you're on a team that's that good, that's that, you know, high profile in its talent, it's not a secret. Like people know who those teams are, who those coaches are, who those players are. And those teams have probably been around longer than a year. They've probably been around longer than five years. And so it's really difficult to make those teams. But when you're on them, like even the subs, even the bench players are getting getting good looks to go to like pretty decent colleges. 
So what's the emotional impact of that? You're talking about it as sports, as the ticket out. How does that impact you to know that the stakes are that high? I mean, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of pressure. It's, it's, it's your everyday, like waking experience of like, I live in a place where you don't want to be here (laughs) past high school, right? You want to get out of this place if you can. You know, every day that you're not working, every day that you're not practicing, every day that you're not playing is somebody else is and somebody else is got their hand on your ticket, right? And and so that is also being poured into you by the coaches, you know, by like they're reminding you constantly, like, this is how you go to college. This person's gonna be at our game, this person's coming to our practice, this person is is the person that can help you get to the next level and that is beat into you um constantly and so you you're never you're always thinking about the future in that in that regard you're always thinking about what do i have to do that so that my mom doesn't have to like work three jobs and that we can live in a place where like people aren't being shot outside and all the things that go along with like feeling the responsibility of like you got to be Superman. You got to be someone's savior. It's up to you and your athletic ability. How how hard do you work to change your sometimes your whole family circumstances? And it's a it's an unfair burden, but that is typically it. That's typically the burden of you know kids playing in those in those neighborhoods who are trying to either get to college or the pros. So having lived that, and then you transition into TV and film, producing, writing, directing, I'd like you to describe where were you when the BS High IMG game was unfolding and what was going through your head? I was at home and I saw it like starting to blow up. And I'm I'm like, what like what is going on? Because I'm always looking at like whatever's trending or whatever's happening on, on social media. I remember seeing it and just being like in, engrossed in everyone's tweets and jokes and memes about it. And I remember reading it and I, and I think I actually tweeted when they make the documentary about this, it's going to be called BSI. I hope it's called BSI or some version of that. So you had no idea that you were directing the doc? It was so, it was so funny. It's like whoever directs this, I hope they call it BSI. Um, literally having no idea this would fall into my lap in the way that it did. And so, yeah, I was just like following along at home with like everybody else and just enjoying this unbelievable story of this team that somehow found their way on ESPN playing against the number one team in the country and getting demolished. It was pretty, it was pretty crazy. So tell me about when you came on board with your partner and co-director, Martin Desmond Rowe, what's the movie that you thought you were going to make? We thought it was just going to be not so crazy, like a fun, funny, like, oh, look how these guys like did this crazy thing. And we saw a clip of Roy that they had shot, like some, just some, like some interview stuff. And we're like, oh, this guy's super fascinating. Like we definitely should do this. Cause this guy is like someone, you know, would be great television, fun to talk to. How are you feeling? Terrified. Don't let the hardware scare you, man. It's just machines. Yeah, that's what Neo said. Look what problems (laughs) it caused him. By the time we got into it, it was just like a thing I was not prepared for. (laughs) in the way that like, in the way that it actually, what it turned into. What was that like for you? Because you've been in the shoes of a lot of these kids and you're making this film about them. And then the tone shifts about what the film is gonna be about. I think it was because, I think it was when we finally started talking to the kids because, you know, our first interview of the whole film was with Roy because we wanted to get as much from him up front as possible so that we could juxtapose that against what we were being told along the way. And then we would circle back to, you know, button all that stuff up. But once we started talking to the kids, like the, the, we spent like 30 hours with Roy and, you know, there was a, there was a moment, there was a period of time we were like, I don't really like hate this guy. Like he seems like very fascinating, very like interesting. I get his like, motivations and then the moment we talked to the first kid it was like oh i fucking hate this dude like this dude is teared like it was all a ruse it's all like 
it's all fake. It's all smoke and mirrors. He's running a con on everybody, including us. And it wasn't until you started hearing what he'd actually done to people that that started to click. And so after we, I remember after we were interviewing Zayshan, I still be having some pain in my lower back. So I just dealt with it. I feel like it left me with a permanent injury. I do regret going to Bishop Sycamore. During our first break in the interview, I remember me and Martin going up to each other. And we both were like, I don't ever want to be in a room with that guy again. Like, I'd like, what a horrible person to do what he did to this kid. Like, and then everybody you talked to had the same story. Every kid had the same story. How was the disparity between what he thought he was doing and what actually happened so wide? Like, how, what, what was going on? I want to talk about the last interview with Roy when we brought him back after we heard from all the kids and you had to sit across from him and ask him these things, which isn't easy. What was your thinking going into that final conversation? I went into it thinking, okay, this is going to be like fun, interesting. I've interviewed plenty of people before this, never in this context, but I know how to talk to people. And once I realized uh, we were playing a different game, like this is not like sitting down to interview someone for your podcast who's like your buddy or has a mutual interest. Like this is like, I'm actually kind of having to put on a journalist hat in a way that I never had to before because I have a, I have to service this story and these kids in a way that even I don't know yet because I haven't talked to them, right? So I don't even know what, what my job completely is at this point. I just know I need to get as much out of this person as possible to get as close to the truth as possible. And then once I started to like see who he was and what was happening, there was part of me that felt like, oh man, I have to, on some level, destroy this black man's life <laughs> by getting to the truth. And I know the truth is going to make his life harder, make his life possibly, you know, put him in jail, depending on what we, what we uncover. That in and of itself just feels strange, just as a black person, as a black man, but you also want people to be, you know, held responsible for the things that they do, for the decisions they make. That's the task that I took. It's part of the reason why I took on the task of wanting to make this movie was to, because it was happening to people who look like me, who come from places where, like where I came from, and you want it to not happen anymore. And once it became clear to me that Roy was going to protect Roy at all costs and do what he wanted to do or needed to do to get what he wanted out of us and what he wanted out of this experience, then it made it easier to go, okay, like I have less sympathy for you as just a human being who did what you did. And I can put my feelings aside after a certain point. Bruh, it, it, it's not, there's, there's no way to win it. Roy, what, what did you do wrong? What would you change? I said I sent y'all home. I was dumb. It was exhausting, like doing the mental, like dance with him in totality. I learned so much from the hours and hours we spent talking to him and sitting across from him because I just never knowingly encountered someone like him before in that way. Someone who whose core mission is manipulation and charm to get any and everything they want. And it works so well. Okay, one last question. What impact do you hope the film has? I mean, I really, really hope that it causes people to really examine the high school to professional sports pipeline in this country. Because you it's it's unfortunately a really just heartbreaking story the way it plays out, but it's it's heartbreaking for a reason. I saw an opportunity that I thought could change my life. And once I really, you know, figured out that they couldn't help me and they wasted my time, that kind of, that hurt me in like a, a dramatic way. What started as a joke, what started as a funny story on the internet really became an expose in our failures as a society and how we protect kids in all aspects. We think about so much about the sexual innocence and the sexual protection of children, but that's not the only way they're preyed on. 
Like there's so many other ways that we don't even consider or think about or talk about that have very similar mental and lifelong effects. Very similar. Like trauma is trauma, right? Like the impact that it has on you is still the impact, whether it happens to you through uh, being misled and taken advantage of or, or in a, uh, in a sexual manner, like it, it's, it's trauma. It affects you. And as a child, it can change the trajectory of your life in, in really, really horrible ways. I mean, you know, you know, we talk to people who talk about being suicidal because of the experience they had. Well, I told my mom, I, I don't even want to be here no more. You know, I was losing everything. I know what hurt is. I know what depression is. I was lost. And like, that's not nothing. Like, that's a big deal that you made a kid want to die. <laughs> like, that moment for me was so, like, I was floored. Coming up, an interview with an expert on con men, award-winning journalist Diana Henriquez. But first, a word from our sponsors. You've covered all types of financial malfeasance. What makes sports ripe for that type of act? Sports is one of those categories where people suspend skepticism in a cloud of hero worship. And that's just one of the most dangerous environments for investors uh, and, and for gullible people. And one of the most opportune environments for con artists. The bona fides of the sports hero, whether it's a player or a coach, the bona fides are there. I mean, they were proven on the field. There's no dispute. This was a star. And that stardom was clear to everybody. That disarms the burglar alarm. You know, that unplugs the burglar alarm. It makes it, it reduces your skepticism. A sports star, a sports coach, a beloved uh, uh, sports university uh, coaching figure is assumed to be trustworthy, is assumed to be successful because they've been immensely successful in their chosen field. Um, and that instills in people a degree of trust that blinds them to the red flags they ought to be looking at. In this case, there was the coach-player dynamic, and a number of those players had issues from school or at home. How does that dynamic between an authority figure and the young people that follow that authority play into potential issues? Mentor-protege uh, phenomenon surfaces in so many Ponzi schemes and in so many other forms of financial fraud. Um, in the Madoff case, for example, Bernie Madoff, the largest Ponzi scheme in history, his you know, right-hand man, his trusted lieutenant who helped him run the fraud, came to work for him straight out of high school, had never worked for anybody else, idolized Bernie Madoff, never questioned anything that he, he was asked to do because Madoff had made his career. He had you know, paid him more than he ever could have made anywhere else, given him entree to the world of Wall Street that he never could have had. That works in the sports world as well. The, the amount of gratitude that um, a player figure would have towards this you know, kind of fairy godfather with the magic wand who you know, touches you on the head and, and, and leads you to believe that your dreams will really come true even beyond the normal suspension of skepticism that you see when, when a sports hero is uh, the front for a financial scam, that further uh, blinds uh, the participants to the risks that they're running. You know, we're hardwired to trust each other. Even beyond the mentor-protege relationship, I mean, we live in a modern economy that's impossible without trust. We buy things on the internet from people we aren't even sure exist. We've never seen them before. We send them our money. And it almost always works out. We're hardwired to trust other human beings. Add to that the, these powerful dimensions of hero worship, of dependence, of that kind of magic touch, that these life-transforming opportunities 
that young players can get from coaches or that young starlets can get from directors or that you know young executives can get from a charismatic CEO. That mental protege relationship adds a further level of blindness, a further level of vulnerability uh, to to the arrangement. Right. And so if we're hardwired to trust, and I'm sure you hear this all the time, people say, well, I would never fall for that. The best line I ever heard about the Bernie Madoff scandal was from a fraud analyst who said, if it sounds too good to be true, you're dealing with an amateur. The con men who are successful in their field, and I don't care whether it's finance, whether it's sports, whether it's politics, the con men who are successful uh, never sound too good to be true. They sound just good enough to be attractive, but never too good to be true because they're too smart to do that. That's a giveaway. Everybody knows that. So if you think, if you think the con man is going to come swaggering towards you, you know, like, like uh, you know, uh, the life of the party, buying drinks, twisting your arm. You got it. It you got to invest right away. Double your money in thirty days. That is absolutely obsolete. That is not the picture of modern frauds, modern Ponzi schemes, modern uh, financial scams. But this tragedy is, Mary, that when you're dealing with these great disparities of power, you know, a, a young af- athlete, you know, really not much power in his or her corner except their skill and their talent. And a powerful, admired, charismatic coach or athletic director who can open all sorts of doors and make all sorts of dreams come true. The power imbalance there um, added to the normal tendency to trust other people um, makes it doubly devastating and doubly dangerous. I would imagine that's also part of what the survivor experience is like. What does going through something like this, how does that impact the victims in these cons? You know, I wish I could say that the the happy story is that most people dust themselves off, pick themselves up and and start over again. But that isn't the case. I mean, as you know, in the Madoff story, there were several tragic suicides by people who had been who realized that they'd been ruined by this man that they had trusted so so thoroughly. I know uh, have kept track of many victims uh, in the Madoff case, and some of them have moved on. They have, you know, accepted their losses, you know, given themselves a pass for their, uh, uh, for their, um, their, their trustingness and, and moved on. But there are some that I know who almost are literally keeping their money in a mattress that they, they barely even trust a regulated bank anymore. Their trust in the financial world was completely exploded by their experience with Bernie Madoff. So out of every collection of victims in a scam, whether it's in the sports world, whether it's in the political world, or whether it's in in the world of finance, there will be some who will never recover their their trust in the way the world works. They'll never recover their, um, that trusting nature. And as I said, the reason we're hardwired to trust is because it's a survival technique. We, it, it's how we climbed out of the caves. The ability to trust, to form social groups, to form economies that trust one another creates a richer, deeper, more meaningful life. And so, yeah, if you don't trust anybody anymore, you won't fall prey to the next con man. But look at everything else you give up. Look at everything else you lose. Um, so it's a cure that's worse than the disease almost. Let's look at the other side of the con. You interviewed Madoff in jail. Can you just talk about what's going on with that person who's at the center of a crime like this? Are they worried about getting caught? Is there remorse? Well, I, during the course of the crime, of course, this is the most self-delusional creature on the planet because you know they persuaded themselves that there's some other exit from this fraud than a trip to a, a place without an extradition treaty. The inevitable outcome of a Ponzi scheme is you run out of new victims. Bernie was ex- Bernie Madoff was extraordinary in that that was a genuinely global Ponzi scheme. He found victims all around the world. 
But when the market turned against him, even he ran out of new victims. Smaller Ponzi schemes run out of new victims much faster. It, so it's during the operation of the fraud that the fraudster is deluding himself or herself into thinking, I can keep this going. Some of them delude themselves further thinking, I can not only keep it going, but I can make enough money to pay back what I stole and no one will ever know. And there's a fatalism about their, their arrest. There's a fatalism uh, almost as if, well, that they were resigned that eventually it would, it would fall apart. Certainly, that was the impression I got from Madoff. After he was arrested, I watched um, this, I, I watched this little remorse theater go on, you know, where he did this little remorse play where he said all the right words. The script was, I'm very remorseful. But over time, that got shabbier and thinner and less believable and less authentic. And in the last of our conversations, which were around 2015 or so, he was almost at the point of, you know, I don't know what my victims are complaining about. They made lots of money off of me anyway. Ultimately, many of these criminals are sociopaths. They just fundamentally cannot feel the emotions. They cannot identify with the pain they're inflicting on their victims. Last question. Is there such thing as a reformed con man? I've heard fairy tales about reformed fraudsters. Um, I think they're sort of like leprechauns. You, you have to believe in them sincerely or you can't see them. Too often, financial frauds like this are driven by a personality that genuinely does not believe that the rules apply to them. They're exempt. And once you've incorporated that belief in, into a life for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, I think it's very, very hard to um, rewire yourself to say, no, 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 I've got to comply with the same laws other people do. I've got to look out for other people. I've got to be a, a faithful steward of the people who trust me. So I am extremely skeptical of the reformed uh, con artist. The business history is replete with people who you know, come out of prison and swear that they've learned their lesson and that they'll never do it again. And some of them even go on and become consultants to other companies about how to protect themselves from the kind of fraudster I used to be. Um, and in several spectacular cases, they have sinned again. They have committed fresh crimes on the top of their old crimes. So there's not a lot of evidence that shows that uh, genuinely dedicated uh, and once successful con artists can ever change their spots. So I think I'd love to see it. It would be a marvelous thing, but I just, uh, uh, I'll watch for the leprechaun first. Thank you all for listening to the series. It has been a joy bringing you all inside the making of BS High. Thank you to Spencer Paysinger, Martin Desmond Rowe, Trayvon Free, Meech Golden, and Diana Henriquez for joining us here on the BS High podcast. Hopefully by now, if you haven't watched the BS High documentary yet, you should do that right now. Check it out on HBO and streaming on Max. 